Hello everyone, welcome to our Egyptian online seminar group. First, keep your microphones off. Then, if you have any questions, you can ask our speaker after his presentation. I have great pleasure of welcoming Professor Kilom. Kilom is a professor in accounting and director of Center for Environment and Social at the University of Essex. Kilom is globally known as a critical researcher in accounting and development policy. He has published in top-ranking journals, including uh, Accounting, Auditing, and Accountability Journal, a Critical Perspective on Accounting, Accounting Forum, a Qualitative Research in Accounting and Management, a Journal of Public Budgeting, a Accounting and Finance Management, Journal of Accounting and in Emerging Economics, Research in uh, Accounting in Emerging Economics, and International Journal of Critical Accounting, he has an active member of uh, Zabava Special Interest Accounting uh, uh, Group on Accounting and Finance in Immersion Economics, uh, African uh, Accounting and Finance Association, and the Comparative Asia uh, Africa Governmental Accounting Groups. Now we will start our seminar with Professor Kilo. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, nice introduction. And, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, uh, you know talk to you, and then uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. I take this as a great opportunity to share the work that I'm doing, and not just me. With me, there's a sort of a great number of scholars, young and senior scholars, working on these global projects of accounting, accountability, and global development. So you probably some of you are members of uh, African Accounting and Finance Association, and you some of you are aware that um, we, we were planning to do our FR, we call FR, African Accounting and Finance Association workshop in Cairo, New City of Cairo. So because of COVID, unfortunately, we missed that opportunity uh, to meet you all there in your own, one of your own universities. Anyway, hopefully next year, once this uh, vac vaccines are being approved, available, we, we probably do the conference again in, 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 in Egypt, I guess. Yeah, so without wasting your time, I just uh, focus on to the, our topic of the day. So I thought this uh, I talk broadly about accounting, accountability and global development. In other words, we call it accounting and development policy. This is what my main background, I publish a lot in accounting and development uh, issues. And then currently my work is very much, you probably have seen my recent uh, publications that uh, they are mainly in the public sector. So that is the, my specialism now. And uh, so uh, recently we have, as you can see in the, this slide, recently I have, uh, uh, I, I was acting as a special issue editor. You know, special issue, the, the journals, they appoint, uh, identify special teams and appoint a team of scholars to manage the issue. So I've been managing this, uh, one of the special issues for the Journal of Accounting and in Emerging Economies. That's one of our main journals in, 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 in Emerging Economies Research, together with uh, Arun Tankam and Ashraf Junaid. They are two colleagues of my same university. And so we, that special issue we focused on, uh, uh, we discussed on this alternative perspectives on accounting and accountability in the global development. And then we, we investigated the, the authors and we invited the authors to investigate uh, the, the new and, and varied concepts and the practices and the impact of role on the, on this in this global development projects in emerging economy. So we have found six excellent papers. And then now this special issue is already available online. I mean, there are six excellent papers. And uh, so this is the, the presentation I'm making today is more, is, is based on the, uh, our, editorial paper, you know, review paper that the special issue editors write together, editorial paper reviewing <coughs> the uh, selected, <coughs> selected papers, as well as the related literature on the themes identified from the accepted papers. So this is the uh, sort of what I'm presenting today. So if you want, anyone want to know more about what I talked today, then you can read that this uh, edited, uh, paper, editorial paper published in JEE, I think still is not available, but other six papers are available online. Those papers are excellent papers. I recommend those who are interested to do accounting and development studies 
PhD or master dissertation or research to look at those papers available online. So that our, our my paper with Arun and Junaid will be available soon. So you can see that paper as well if you're interested to know more. So in my presentation, however, include my other work as well. So in addition to these six papers and the editorial paper discussion, I also use my own research work and the findings from my own research to support my discussion and the arguments. Right. So the aim of the presentation is as threefold. You can see here, I will provide kind of overview about changing landscape of global development, not just accounting, but in general, there's the, the, the landscape, the, the, the context of uh, uh, global development is now changing. So the new context we need to understand before starting or is thinking about our research topic or uh, methodologies or any other sort of other details, you need to know broadly is the context of global development or con context of development policy in general, right? So then the second part of the discussion, I will focus and I'll, I'll explain and discuss and I provide a review of uh, review and reflections on the current state of uh, 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 accounting, accountability, and development research in emerging economies. So that include the accepted paper, papers of this JE special issue, plus my own work and other my colleagues' work as well to understand the, the, the current state of the research on this topic. And then the third part, that's the other important part for future researchers or future research projects. So to identify the emerging themes from the special issue as well as the other current research projects or the papers published, and then the, these contributions of uh, those research projects and the papers, plus at the end, the potential for future research, research studies uh, 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 that for the future projects and the PhDs or the master dissertations. <clears throat> First point, as I said, so this will start from, the, from an overview of changing landscape. So changing landscape. So what was the landscape before? What was the context before? If you read the uh, uh, con con uh, accounting, accountability research in emerging economies, accounting, accountability, and development research in relation to emerging economies, you can see that the, the all these discussions were very much focusing on World Bank, IMF, and, uh, uh, and this uh, conventionally known development organizations and the agencies. But now the new global order, it is in a way not new, but who are in our research, this is new because we are not focusing much on the dominance of China. There are Chinese scholars, Chinese academics, but still the, the, the counting and development issues in relation to the Chinese influence. It's not about Chinese accounting, it is about uh, operations of China, Chinese development aid, the Chinese bank or BRICS, you know, the organization very much of parallel to World Bank as a BRICS, B-R-I-C-S, BRICS. So there's members of China, Brazil, India, and two other um, uh, uh, new giants, new global giants together form this BRICS bank. So they invest uh, uh, money. And so then uh, the, the, the problem is in our researchers now, not, not, they are not very much concerned about new global or the power of China in, in emerging economies. Now, if you look at most of these African countries that you are very much familiar, and there are Chinese projects, development projects going on, massive projects. Actually, they are more dominant than the World Bank in, in, in these African countries, and they invest heavily on the um, uh, uh, various fields in the development project within Africa. So then if you are doing a research project on this accounting, accountability and development, so why don't you consider some projects and then the, the accounting uh, and the technologies used by the Chinese, Chinese banks or China in their bilateral or, or multinational projects. And then they see the whole this uh, account public sector or government, uh, governmental accounting issues in relation to this uh, Chinese investment, so Chinese uh, development uh, models. So that is something that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing as a changing landscape, so Chinese domination and the impact to developing countries. And the, the, the other issue is that you can see more and more that the world develop, uh, what you call World Bank and, uh, and, and also UN, they are, they are talking about more and more about uh, sustainability. 
they talk about disaster risk reduction they talk about the environment global warming so that mean the the as accounting researchers accounting and accountability researchers so there's a shift for us to move towards there so in in, in, in a broader landscape so social and environmental sustainability so sustainability global sustainability indicators is one of the examples you can see 365 indicators for the sustainability issues by un and then the world bank sponsors some projects on that so sustainability sustainable development discourse if you look at world bank's annual report now they talk about uh, sustainable development so it's not like previously they said poverty elevation they talk about poverty they talk about poverty elevation but now they talk about sustainable development that's another major change happening in the landscape of global development and then the third thing is that this is not new but our focus is not happened this way uh, uh, it is about the power of epistemic community and an intellectual colonization what does that mean the, the epistemic, epistemic community mean the the international accounting bodies and development consultants so they are operating all over the emerging economies they are selling their products acca icim icqm all these the profession and, and then isb they, they are providing training to local people they are providing uh, training to professional they are selling professional accounting programs in our emerging economies so they are all like dominating and dictating the the knowledge the intellectual uh, field in other way the conceptual colonization intellectual colonization so their knowledge very much forcing and and also big four big four companies in 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 together with epistemic community together with big four companies they are they are dominating the the intellectual field in emerging economy so then that's another uh, uh, it's not new but it is is more stronger than ever so it is another a uh, significant global development and then the 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 last and then the most important to me is the impact of covid and then what happened with the covid you all know that in every country across the world that uh, the uh, all over the world you can see that the covid has destroyed the existing mechanisms and the institutions and and then the economies political economy so then the the what is what was normal before is not anymore so that create the term the discourse we call new normalcy everything is new normal like like this seminar the conference in the normal situation i might have visited cairo and for our african accounting conference and then might have done this presentation in university of cairo rather than on doing online but unfortunately because of the covid now our academic my way of communication to my students or my fellow researchers like you now create uh, through this zoom or, or virtual uh, modes of communication so that's a new normal for the academics it is same thing is much bigger when it come to the way organizations work the public sector work and then uh, more like uh, uh, flexible work styles and then the uh, people stay home and work and then um, the the governments they have to think about new way of uh, new economic policies and because the 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 uh, tourism is uh, almost dead and then public institutions are not functioning so they had to repair all these economic uh, structures and then the organizational setups to suit with the the context created by covid and then the post covid context new no one knows about post covid context yet but in a more more research word if i use everything is deconstructed that mean everything is collapsed so that mean everything has to now reconstruct so the developed economies or the governments in developing world including us like developed countries like uk and i'm talking from uk i'm saying working in uk and then us uk our economies and our governments also in a way in the, in a highly problematic situation you can see the challenge that the we all are facing now developed countries developing countries together so you can imagine in the developing countries this is huge and the governments uh, they, they are they are the what you call uh, resilience you know the word resilience that mean the how the governments how strong the governments are to in facing the external environmental shocks that mean challenges like like pandemic 
so are they were they ready the governments are not ready so we are most of this emerging economies already having so much of debts to develop country so that mean uh, they are like uh, they are like uh, <clears throat> very much dependent on developed country so they haven't got the resilience that mean the strength financial or economic strength to face these external challenges so that mean the resilience there's no resilience a weak resilience so that is becoming more evident in the covid situation the governments are struggling to give welfare <clears throat> to the victims and looking after their uh, citizens the i mean developing countries during covid i'm saying so then in the post covid that mean after covid is managed assuming so new vaccines work okay then next year next september okay we just can assume this uh, covid is under control so then governments have to think about new normals and then reconstruct new their yeah, development strategies maybe uh, what you call income income substitution or import, import substitution import substitution local industries maybe they focus on that less foreign more foreign aid less foreign loans you get my idea less foreign loans more uh, foreign aid i mean interest free money so this maybe these are the things that they are thinking so they have to think in the future so this is the this is what i call changing landscape the context of global development right so the nas accounting researchers is very important for us because we are focusing on accounting accountability and global development so we are coming to that later okay so i'm going to the second objective of the session the kind of objective is that i am trying to uh, give you a review of some kind of account about uh, synthesize about the, the 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 past accounting accounting and development policy research and the literature so when you are looking at the past i mean from 1980s to recent past that the 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 accounting accountability and development research what they have focused on that's what my synthesis here so then the first point that when i looking at looking at this literature broadly i'm not talking about like some of you probably familiar integrated reporting uh well, broadly we call sustainability reporting or or environment or management accounting and control i'm not bothering about this technical sides of account it is important those research but i'm looking at the bigger picture i'm looking at all what this whole research in accounting development and accountability what they broadly cover so when you look at what they broadly cover together what they to what they cover together as a group of researchers we can see three areas that they have addressed in the past right the first thing is the role of accounting language and the technology in establishing public accountability as part of the debates on good governance and development good governance and development and including transparency participation and inclusion social justice social justice if you look at these papers from the new hope i tell jaising and this is my paper the last two there's my paper with vikram singh and jaising and udin 2000 we talk about how the world bank the imf how uh, how they use accounting language and accounting terms uh to to make their make the uh, you know uh, host countries or developing countries economy more visible how they use accounting to control the activities of developing countries and making sure developing countries spend this world bank money wisely and more efficiently and effectively to so create good governance and then how these countries create transparency and the participation in financial reporting for example and participated in budgeting for example so the language and the technology used to create conditions with the with the developed countries by world this is by world bank this is by asian development bank this is by african development bank this is by brics or uh, chinese bank so this is they use this accounting language and the technology to 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 create these conditions to create transparency to create improve participation participated budgeting for example and then make people involved in the decision making by all the stakeholders involved in the decision making this is one one sort of a research stream that 
so many people work on. So I mentioned few of the leading scholars in that. The second uh, uh, point in the past uh, accounting and development research literature or the research projects is the, 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 the focus on government and NGO led large scale social accountability program. So then NGO non-governmental organization used to, uh, uh, to work with the civil society. So then the, to work as a third sector organization because the governments were corrupt. So then, uh, then the, uh, 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 the pri private sector not interested on the development issue. So then non-governmental organization, international and national and local non-governmental organization were, were used in the past to create social accountability. So create the accountability from the bottom of accountability to the community and then accountability to the beneficiaries and looking at the communities and the society. So there were so many of papers published in the past about NGO accountability and there was a private public partnerships and there are so much of research alternative organizations and third sector organizations that you can see. So there are people that publish and you can see I am also there are one of my papers and then I publish more than that but just one of the main papers recently. So NGO uh, social accountability. And then uh, the, uh, the, this project of this looking at social accountability emerged most strongly by the recent projects by Arun Nettel 2020 and then my work in parts, uh, 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 Journal of uh, Public Budgeting, Accounting and Accountability as we talk about collaborative accountability, how these non-governmental organizations together with work together with the governmental and private sector organizations together. So there are different types of multiple accountabilities that can be formed and more to satisfy the needs of the victims in the disasters and then uh, 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 the victims like uh, Sasta, vulnerable people like poor uh, people living below the poverty line. So vulnerable people. And then in those contexts that how we create this, uh, uh, bring the uh, institutions together. That is what the collaborative accountability means. So the NGO, non-governmental organization is the main institutional focus in this whole discussions of social accountability. This is the second branch of literature. In the third level, you can see the, the, the critical accounting research. I know, I mean, I know most of you are interested uh, applying quantitative methodology. And then you all were trained basically in new organizations with the quantitative approach. And you are thinking of uh, using data sets and analyzing data using a model. That's fine, I'm fine with that. But that constrain your way of seeing the broader events and why these things are happening, how these things are happening. Because most of this quantitative research, what they do is they, they produce some pieces, some output to explain what is going on. So it's describing the thing, describing the organizational practice, describing how the organizations report the things. But if you want to do, do more, see more, like uh, why this, uh, 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 this discrimination happened too much, why this, Poverty elevation cannot be uh, achieved. Why this corruption happened? And then what accounting does, but why accounting fail? And why accounting reform fails? Like non new public management. And then the, uh, the, uh, the, the accrual accounting, accrual accounting, shift from cash accounting to accrual accounting. Why these projects fail? So that need more critical accounting research. So what I'm seeing is in the past that the critical accounting research project is becoming more stronger and stronger over these years. You can see again, I'm there, and then Professor Hopper, and then Lasso, and then Uding, and there are new, and this group of scholars have promoted the critical accounting research, that means using social theories, using theories to understand what is going on. Sometimes we can see things from our own eyes, from the data sets, from big data sets, but if you use a theory, you can see more. That is what this uh, research group is doing. So then the, that's a third main strand happening in accounting, accountability and development uh, research. Okay, now I'm going to the uh, next step or the ne next uh, phase of my discussion. So now I am talking about 
the emergent that mean what the new issues these are not brand new but these issues just started coming more and more in our research projects and that's what i call use the word emergent and the interrelated themes on accounting accountability and development that has been emergent in the in the recent past especially in late uh, 2000 and early and late to i think i can say in in 2000 especially in 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 mid 2000 and onwards and to now this these ideas of uh, like uh, these these themes that i am highlighting here are emerging more from our uh, research as i mentioned the i mentioned here you can see a uh, special issue and other recent publications so then this special issue i have edited for jee journal of accounting and emerging economies so we have seen there were there are these six papers we selected they were addressing these issues in these three areas and the, and also there were other recent publications doing exactly the same addressing these three main issues what are these three main issues let's see so you can see in the slide but i take more into discussion these three points in separate slides let me do that so first point is financialization and intellectual colonization of the developed of the developed world that mean colonization happening in developing world so by the developed world so there are two things one is intellectual colonization what is that mean the conceptual colonization what does that mean that mean the the epistemic community that's what i mentioned the people on this uh, people the what you call uh, professional accounting bodies international accounting bodies international consultants and they are selling i said that the they are selling this accrual they are selling this npm they have been funded by world bank they go to developing countries sell these things that is that is a one one that is one of my papers i mentioned uh, 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 in the next slide i think so they are i talked about the intellectual colonization how this is happening and this published in cpa so you can see that paper if you are interested is a, a critical perspective it's an accounting journal we publishes that paper i just briefly say that paper because that's important in the next slides as well so that paper we talk about sub-saharan africa how these uh, governmental accounting reforms are being sold by this epistemic community to the to these ssa countries sub-saharan uh, African countries, governments, and then those were resisted by the local communities and some of the local communities in some way. So we are showing that in the paper. So my point in this discussion, this, this slide is to show one side of that story in that paper that mean to how they colonize, intellectually co colonize, then using knowledge, power, knowledge as a power to teach us what to do. So one of these papers, Alam et al. 2020, in this slide as mentioned, that gives the classic account of how developed countries doing that. And they, they, they present a story. But it's, it's a very fascinating story. I think you all have to read that paper in JEE that is available online. They provide auto-ethnography. That means their own experience, authors' own experiences in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh universities. And they talk about how, what extent these academic curriculums were colonized, that means this is American or British or foreign country ideas are being taught in the class, in the lectures. Textbooks written by Philip Kotler, textbooks written by Drury, textbooks written by Collier. They have been sold to these emerging economies and they have been taught in the class. So it's more like programmed, like McDonaldization. McDonaldization, that means it's like selling McDonald's uh, uh, food, food in all over the country. You can see the same slogan, same assign the same products and burgers. So this is a similar thing in the academic institution. They, they are brutally critical of what happened. And then the MACMA 2020, they talk about how the accounting professionalization happened in China and then how the ISAB and AICPA, ICAW, they use this as gatekeepers and forcing Chinese firm to use this international accounting standards. That is what they are showing and then bureaucracy and pressure given by this accounting organization. So that is what we call intellectual colonization. And then the other side of the colonization is financialization and environmental damage. So this is a very common story. You all know that I don't, I'm not very much aware about uh, Egypt, but I know Africa, this is happening. There's one of these case studies in published in the paper 2000, 
that our special issue that by NOAA to ETEL, they talk about how international oil companies in Nigeria, they, they uh, uh, break the safety regulations and accountability requirements and then form of oil spillage and et cetera and get away from the from being penalized, no punishment. They do whatever environmental damages and they use the, uh, because the governments are uh, neutral or powerless because of the big money these uh, this, uh, oil firms bring to these countries. So they are powerless because of the financialization. So they create environmental damage. So then that's another bigger issue, colonization in, in financialization issue is a bigger threat in the country. So they are uh, research papers talking about that. And then <clears throat> you can see the next second, next point, next important point is about uh, the nexus, the, 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 the common ground between the Western world, the epistemic community and the local elite. So I already explained this example about my paper in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. That's what I mentioned in the third point here. I mentioned it here as the uh, third point you can see here. This is my paper. I talk about Sub-Saharan Africa so that you are aware of the same story, but in this paper by Alam, Etel, and Shaula uh, herself, I only single out that paper. They talk about how this is happening. Um, Alam's paper, senior accounting professors perpetuating the, the uh, Western knowledge in the classroom. Shaula talked about uh, how local elites are being working involved with the corruption with the public officials in. Uh, in an in Indian project with Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Scheme happened in, in India, how they involved the corrupt practices. And then NOAA 2020 provides further examples about this uh, oil company, how they are doing this uh, with the local politicians, how they include uh, involved with the corrupt activity. So this is the point. The point here is the epistemic community, the people who have the knowledge, like professional consultants, accounting bodies, and the local elites, the local politicians, locally powerful people together involved with the corruption, involved with the corrupt practices. So that is something another people, accounting researchers, they focused on that and they explain how they use accounting and break the laws of accounting and then how they manipulate accounting and how they report lies and then misleading information and then how they break the accountabilities. So accountability relationships. This is the research projects they did. And then the third of these emerging themes, the resistance. Aha, this is what I like very much. And even though that all this corruption, even though all this power of uh, intellectual communities, I mean, powerful epistemic communities, even though the local elites are involving with these corrupt activities, now there is a trend in the, in the developing world that there is so much of resistance is emerging by the government, some of the governments, or by some local actors involved. This, this resistance is not like they are having uh, what you call demonstrations or picketing or, or saying no, no for the World Bank money or, or challenging in the courts or something, but it is more of like a, a, some sort of pragmatic. That means they find a way a, a certain strategically, strategically, depending on the context, they strategically, strategically, they, they mean local states, the developing country states, not all the states, but some states, and then the local actors like the local accounting, local public sector accountants, or local community, or local NGOs. So they are, uh, they are reacting. So there are some evidence, it's not my personal story, there's evidence we, 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 in these published papers in the special issue, for example, McQuay's paper here, you can see the McQuay 2020 paper, that means it's one of the papers in the special issue. He talked about how the Chinese government, even though Chinese government uh, buying and then borrowing the ideas from international accounting bodies, but the government have, having their own control. So what that means, they are using indigenous accounting profession, local accounting bodies to control the Western lines. That means control the Western pressure. So in China, you all know, the outsiders can't do whatever they want after arriving in China. So then even international accounting bodies, while they are selling their programs into Chinese firms, that the Chinese government is capable. And then 
using their own control mechanisms and then the power to control the damage, to control the presence of this Western colonization. So they do that. The McQuist paper shows that. And then this is very interesting paper. Sunday Win and Kofinas 2002, again, special issue paper. It show how the Myanmar government liberalized banking industry and allowed many private banks to operate in the country. So behind the meaning of liberalization, the government used both state-led and market-led controls, simulate and return the socialist banking model. That is ex that's an example for Myanmar. And you can see the Myanmar, they are the, uh, the, the, COVID, the COVID impact also almost like zero because they have their own control mechanisms to manage COVID. So that is uh, another example so of resistance by developing countries against this uh, Western colonizations. And then Saiful et al. 2020 and Muchinganda et al. 2000, again, JE papers and my paper, CPA paper, my triple J paper, all these papers, we show how the local communities and then the uh, 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 local actors are pressing and then responding and resisting to this uh, external pressures. For example, in this paper, in my paper, Indonesian local community uh, case study, they show how the participatory budgeting, they strategically engage with the participatory budgeting. They keep their own social practice and the social meetings and then decision making with the informal decision making made in the society. And they just pretend that they're attending the formal participatory budgeting, a formal meeting organized by the local government and the central government. They just ceremonially attend that, but they make the decision themselves first. And then they try to use this government forums to get the acceptance and to get the resources from the government. But they do what they want to do rather than following what the government want them to do. They do what they want to do rather than following what the government want them to do. So this is a kind of a typical example, good example in participatory budgeting that people, local communities resist. So in some cases, state resistance, like in China and Myanmar, in the other cases, you can see local actors are resisting. This, uh, this is another emerging, very important emerging theme. Okay, so then, because I want to finish my fin discussion in 40, 45 minutes, so 30, 40 minutes, so I'm close to that. So this, uh, the, the based on this emerging and past research, past research, and then this newly emerged themes and the emerging themes, emergent teams and what are the future directions? What are the future research, future accounting, accountability and development, global development research should take? What directions are available for the future researchers like you in, in the area of accounting, accountability and development in emerging economies? This is uh, basically the ideas from the special issue, ideas gathered from my own projects and then also ideas that with my experience, I, 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 I'm summarizing. There are four areas I'm suggesting. One is success versus failure of development initiatives. So that means focusing on divergent outcomes. So there are some cases, and then especially in this special issue that we mentioned uh, this, the Myanmar case is a successful case study actually. So there are examples of success and failure of development projects. We always think, oh, development failed development projects are failed and there's no room for the success. It is wrong. There is a kind of, a, there is a kind of alternative. There's a diverse outcomes in the development project. So we have to see more open mind and see the success and the failure, success versus failure. Why it is successful in the one country, why it's failing in the other country, not focusing on the developed countries. Because if you focus on developed country and compare a developing country, that is useless. Because developing developed countries, their structures are strong, and they well they have exploited developing countries over 200 years. They colonized those countries. They have robbed the resources from these countries. So their structures are, and their economic capital are very different to developing countries. So comparing UK with Egypt, UK with Egypt is not making any sense. Any sense because these all ideas are like a, a, a program from US or UK, and then try to try the Egyptian government to ask to Egyptian government to follow them. It is not going to work because Egypt, Egypt, Egypt culture, Egyptian politics, Egyptian political economy, Egyptian governmentality 
are different. So what I'm saying is to compare the experiences of hello emerging economies and see the success and the failures of development initiatives. Number two, the successful resistance and emancipation. That means this is a new, new, it's not a new trend in a way. This is the new trend in the sense, this is, these are new research projects that we always found. Like for example, if you are, if you are doing public sector research, you all know, we call it, uh, we assume that the uh, failure of uh, NPM, failure of NPG, failure of accrual. So we are talking about the failure or success, but there's a different side of the story. So there is a, there is a resistance and then the resistance and emancipation in, in developing countries. Sometimes in some developing countries, they adjust the programs to suit with their own institutions. Like in this paper uh, by Danchure 2020 in special issue, they talk about in Sri Lankan universities, some scholars, some, some academics that got the PhDs from UK with, with the critical research. They go in there, they go into these countries and then they challenge the American and quantitative approach in their and then mainstream education and academic colonization in these countries. And then they wanted, they created some critical accounting projects in Sri Lankan universities. So that is what I mean, resistance and emancipation in happening. So this is need to be researched. So then indigenous knowledge, like in my Indonesian case study, so participatory budgeting, local knowledge, were really important and it is all is more beyond the participatory budgeting language and, and, and the technology, local knowledge were massive. So local, so preserving the local knowledge, using the local knowledge and the traditions in developing countries. So this is a resistance and emancipation. We need more research to know how this is happening in Egypt. And then role of state in the development discourse. I think we have seen so many of publications, but still, the public accountability and then the role and 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 then the uh, the uh, the the engagement uh, uh, conflict in behaviors of states like Myanmar. Myanmar produces a very different example. China, very different example. They are engaging state engaging with the uh, financialization. State engaging fighting with the colonization of uh, intellectual colonization. The role of state. We need to report more. Like in this special issue, we need to know more. How is this happening in other countries? And then the, uh, the, the last, but the most important, that the COVID-19 and new normals, I think I mentioned about that because it's a time that whole reconstructing the whole public sector, whole governmental sector organization, whole organization, private sector organization, the new global order, new political, uh, global and national political order, rebuilding public and private organizations. That is, that's, we need, a lot of research in accounting, accountability, and global development. I think uh, I have done my uh, uh, main aim of the discussion. So I wanted to discuss three things. I think I covered those three things. One is the landscape of accounting, accountability, and development, and then you provided you a bit of a literature on this, uh, what, uh, what, what was the, the past project people have focused on, and then we moved on to the emerging themes and then discuss about the future directions of this accounting accountability and global development research project overall. And uh, so uh, uh, there are so many more things I can add, but it's because uh, the plan is to discuss the presentation is 30 to 40 minutes, and then giving more time for you to ask questions. I am more than happy to answer your questions or comments, maybe some of you are uh, not happy with my point, want to challenge me, like in challenge me, I mean academically about that your views are different. So yeah, it's up to you to raise, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, ask any questions. Thank you very much, dear uh, Professor Kelam, for your contribution and your effort. Uh, it's really excellent uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, if you. anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and uh, ask your question. Uh, Professor Mahmoud Naghi, you have a question? You yeah. can open your mic. Yeah. Okay. Thank Prof. you. Thank you, Prof. Kelo. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. For this comprehensive survey about accounting and accountability, there are some inquiries. Firstly, yeah, please. Yeah, please. 
What is the relationship between governors and the accountability in government sector? <laughs> Relation between governors and the accountability in okay. governmental sector. Okay. Uh, secondly, what are the standards standards of socio-economic accounting? Thirdly, what is the role of general budget and fund theory in developing countries to achieve good or sound accountability system? Thank you. Okay, I think these three are really three massive areas, but very important uh, areas. I mean, I have to, I thank you for raising this question. I, I think, again, I just sum up and give you a very short answer, but it's, it's not, it's maybe three different presentations that uh, can be made focusing on these three areas. But first thing is you're asking about uh, the connection between accountability, the governance, and then the, the government, and then the governance. So if we look at the, specifically the definition or the way what we understood by meaning of governance, governance is about accountability, transparency, and the participation. Governance mean accountability, transparency, and participation. So if, when we are asking, when we are making government accountable for their resource allocations, fund allocation, whatever it's called. So government is accountable one way. They have to be accountable to the citizens because the government is appointed by the people in the country. So then government is, government ministers are accountable to the parliament. So then there's a kind of broadly public accountability issue. And then transparency, the information should be shared with the public. That's where the, the budgeting and that thing is connected at the local and national government level. Citizens can, is, is, is able to, or should be able to assess the information, how this, the budgeting is, the social allocation is made, how much money allocated to each and every items. So this is where the transparency happens. So participation is, that's what the participatory budgeting is trying to do to bring the local communities into the decision-making bodies. So the second, I think I connected third question and the first question together to some extent. The second one was about social accounting, isn't it? Social accounting. So what are the, how, what are the standards for the social accounting? You asked about that, if I'm right. I think the, the, the social accounting standards are not coming through the uh, uh, professional accounting bodies like say, there's a standard to say social accounting, but some of the elements of the social accounting integrated into financial reporting requirements, as well as public sector sort of a policy policies and the way that we are sharing information. Folks, what I'm meaning is the CSR, corporate social responsibility. So this idea of CSR in the standards and in the uh, private, private sector policies that share those are sharing the information about this how uh, what extent this the company's performance as uh, are uh, 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 contributing to the wider society and the and the environment so it is the social accounting in that sense are uh, integrated into financial reporting not specifically saying uh, this is the, this is the standard but environmental management accounting environmental reporting and these sort of standards are broadly connected with the social accounting, I can I can refer to those two examples and say, yeah, some extent, yes, but there's no one social accounting standard or, or some kind of mandatory requirement for public sector or private sector as a one glance, but there are various elements in the reporting standards and the policies set up by the government and uh, uh, private sector organizations. I hope that I covered most of the uh, uh, questions you asked. Any other questions? Don't worry to ask questions. I mean, like, I know some of you are early career researchers. Maybe you don't know me, you haven't met me. This is the problem that when we do virtual presentations, because uh, uh, you know, we can't, we have no face-to-face uh, uh, -face interactions to get to know us, each other. But don't worry about that. Maybe question is not much relevant or not important, but uh, Still, that is the question you have in your mind. So I'm more than happy to give my perspective. Maybe my answer is not perfect, but still I can try. Yeah. So I think it's a microphone, isn't it? 
Yeah, please. I, I like more questions if you have. That's, that's good to have questions. Here yeah, is anyone is having any interest in these areas or working in these areas already? Because you cannot go away from these three areas I have mentioned, this way or the other. Your work is, con or every one of you, when I say you, every one of you, all most of you, your work is connected to these areas I highlighted, with or without your knowledge. So this is more like an overview, general overview that I have presented. So I'm sure you can relate some of these points into your individual dissertations or PhD thesis or research paper, depending on the level of your career. So please. Oh, if you cannot ask, you can you can uh, 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 text it, message it, so I can read and comment. Perhaps a question, Kalu, if I use oh, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I escape from Essex fever. <laughs> Just to say hello at the same yeah. time. I, I thought I thought I can uh, hide and go away. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very it's a very uh, honest uh, and, and kind of I think maybe of use to people also. You, you've done research in 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 the, the kind of Asia setting around public sector. And how do you think it applies, let's say, to countries like, uh, you know, MENA, Egyptian and mm. African, you know, what, what sort of lessons or what mm. things you think mm. may be happening in Asia, but not happening mm. in Africa or vice versa, maybe? I mm. I mean. Yeah, I think, I think that's a very good and challenging question in a way that uh, I think when I come, because I have worked in both, both aspects, both sides of the uh, 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 political economies that mean one in some mean South Asia and that side and they're here is side the Africa. So I mean when I compare these two I think my reflection is that the uh, generally the issues are same if when you see the final you know our, our findings coming from that if it's a corruption if it is a transparency issue, if it is a misappropriation issue or if it is a reform failure or accounting um, what you call accrual failure all these things are very much the reasons are same, but one difference I find is that the institutional level and then what I call it like intellectual capital. Like when we are looking at some of the South Asian and Asian countries, we can see the uh, their institutions and then the uh, knowledge capital and the people then who are managing public sector organizations, they are having relatively higher I mean, it's not about the paper qualification. It's about the experience, and then the, at the same time, the institutions are set up already nicely to to suit with the uh, relatively better implementation of reforms. Or, for example, Sri Lanka, for example, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. Even though even though they are struggling with civil wars and infighting, all this, but their institutions and the the human capital are more more stronger than many other countries. But we, I know the, that is that's one thing. The second thing is the culture. And if you look at this uh, uh, South Asian and Asian country, their, their cultures are very much transforming and changing faster than other, other countries of the developing economies. And then and if you see Africa, still they are the African, what you call petromanalism and various other internal cultural differences. And then the, the, the tribal differences and the caste differences still very much strong. And, and then male dominance and all these cultural practices are stronger than this other side, other, 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 other side of this emerging economies. I mean, Asian and South Asian countries. I'm not saying totally uh, different, but there are various, uh, uh, like kind of relatively speaking, stronger cultural, I mean, the norms, practices exist in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. So that is where the problem happens when we are trying to change things. So we have to make the changes incrementally. 
rather than going for wholesale changes. And we have to understand each and every country specific factors like institutions, the cultures, and then the traditions, and then the uh, 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 government and governmentality. And so this is where the uh, uh, area, the way the approach that we need to have, because these countries are contextually different with, with the reasons like I highlighted few of that, but there are various other uh, individual countries, various, various other different uh, institutional and cultural political differences exist. That's what my answer, I don't know whether I answered it. So some of my papers, if you see, even the participatory budgeting, when I report about Africa, is different to what I report in Indonesia and, and Sri Lanka. But there are common issues, there are different issues. Differences coming mainly with the institution and the cultural traditions, I think. Thanks, thanks, Kel. Uh, thank you, thanks, Kel. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Professor Fabian. Uh, you are very welcome. Nice to meet you uh, again. Uh, I'm sorry if my connect uh, problem was my connect. Uh, there is another problem. Uh, another uh, another question. Uh, yeah, Vadim, you can ask. Yeah. Open your mic and ask your question. Vadim, Vadimi, you can ask. Oh, did you? Okay. Uh... Oh, hello, Professor. Nice, uh, nice to talk to you again. Yeah, uh, nice to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just a small, uh, basically, uh, just uh, uh, something to learn as well from you. Basically, we uh, recently found some data from China talking to people, and uh, what we identified was there in China specifically that people are kind of. I, I understand what you said about the cultural differences in different countries, especially in the mm. developing economies. You, uh, there are vast differences in our cultures. And um, uh, it, it was quite interesting because it seems like the people who live there, although we think that uh, the more communist uh, kind of political area, we, we find it more kind of, you know, coming from more democratic uh, countries, we feel that it could be more problematic or whatever. But majority mm -hmm. of those people we spoke to, they find it like they are more like accepting what the government is actually doing over there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And the, uh, the other thing is, because you mentioned about the professional bodies, that is, what I really want to ask you, because what I believe is at the end of the day, the whole world should have some sort of, you know, basic standard that everybody can accept. Mm -hmm. And from there on, we should be able to customize it according to our cultures. So mm -hmm. it's not a way that we can, a kind of a mechanism or something that we could ultimately push these, uh, you know, the regulators or whoever is, you know, uh, these bodies who are formulating mm -hmm. these standards is there a way that at the end of the day, what I believe is whatever the research that we should uh, actually, you know, contribute towards those things. So is mm. there a way, do you think it's, uh, it's working towards that or uh, with current research and everything? Do you see a green light that they are listening to us? Like I've, I've seen in a lot of uh, developing countries, we mm -hmm. have a lot of issues like they are trying to impose certain standards, but at the end mm. of the day, they are not practical. Mm. So have you seen a green light that they are, they are ready to listen to whatever we are finding in our emerging economies. Yeah, I think that's a, that's an excellent question, actually. I'm serious, that's a very good question. I think the this is this is opening up something that everyone need to, I mean, understand about how what how this dialogue between the professional accounting bodies or policy makers and the researchers and then the research practice gap in the sense in the other sense. And uh, this is working, yeah. I'm not like in the grand scale. One there are a few examples I can highlight. Now I am working with uh, uh, working with this uh, World Bank uh, research projects and World Bank sponsored contract research, and then one of that is we just finished. And why my friend uh, Professor Tiruvan, also a member of that team, we together actually did that, and it was about participatory budgeting in 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 Benin, in one of the sub-Saharan Africa. So that is sponsored by World Bank. I mean FIFA, Public Financial Management. You know that body. So they are they sponsored that. So then the findings we made very much like is we are elaborating this same point that the we cannot apply participated we need participated budgeting approach as a like you said it's a universal standard. But when we are implementing participated budgeting in Benin, we shown that Benin is slightly different to another uh, uh, West or sub Sub-Saharan African country. This is a this is a French French speaking country, and there's a French accounting system exists there. And then when you go to French locals, you can see the uh, gender issues. I mean, women, 
less women participation as as a gender issue and the patrimonial issues and there are various specific benin cultural issues of benin reflected in our uh, in, in our interviews and in our case material so we reported to pifa and we recommended pifa as one of the policies that to take this broader public financial management framework that's good but when we are implementing it integrating that with uh, say participatory budgeting in in certain countries specific countries to let the local government or that country to decide what in incrementally incrementally how they can adjust it to suit with their own communities right i have another example i am working i have triple aj paper accounting accountability uh, accounting accountability and auditing journal that under review and is resubmitted one that's about islamic accounting i think you this is a very familiar to you islamic accounting issue in uh, malaysia and, and and bahrain so islamic account there is a islamic accounting body for the region that they are what they do is they work with the international accounting uh, standards committee and then they take this international standards to this part of the world the arabic world and what they do is they they adjust it with it with the islamic values so islamic accounting standards are not totally the same international accounting standards but uh, they have the borrowings of these main ideas from international accounting standards and they they i mean they 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 adjust they adapt it they bring some of the islamic values into the standards islamic they call it islamic accounting standards if we look at islamic accounting standards you can see the both the you know the western ideas ideals of accrual or various other principles of accounting and account reporting as well as islamic values so what is wrong with that that is that is how if, if we want to work with this standardization emancipation and adoption of internationally accepted standards in global and then make a more like a unique and comparative and consistent approach in reporting and and and, and accounting then what we have to do is we have to incrementally adapt it to the particular country we have another paper and professor thiruven also member and we did that study in um, uh, three countries in africa uh, what is this uh, nigeria nigeria tens and two countries nigeria and tanzania we found that the same evidence so it's not it's not working properly because local communities are integrated not integrated with that this idea of reforms because they have very different views because they have been practicing it in, in the over these years there are some colonial features there are some uh, like Fra francophone french accounting and, and anglo american english accounting right so can you change these things you can't you can't have international accounting stand the same way in a french colony same language so you have to change it adapt it to the specific context specific emerging economy that is the only way to work with that i think so they are listening yeah they are listening so most of these professional accounting bodies now they are funding for research they are funding academics to do research then they publish these uh, reports in their websites you can see lots of publications by acca and various other accounting bodies pifa some reports research done by academics and then they were critical then they were more constructive but these are very different approaches to previous accounting body publications so sima another example they are doing quality they are encouraging qualitative research yeah so that is what my view thank you so much yeah thanks yeah. a lot uh there is another question mm. are there another questions if 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 you don't have any questions you can open your mic and ask your question uh there's a one from in the in the text padmi are you there i i just Padmi? ask you uh i i just ask you uh the question Ah right. Okay. 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 You asked the question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The yeah, another one ask any research to compare level of accountability among countries. I would like to be one of the team, please. Ah right. Okay. That's a different question. Yeah. 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 We can we can ask any other questions if you have. I think. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Please. Are there another question? 
I think I think that uh, you have done very well uh, with answering a lot of questions there, dear Professor Kilom. So thank you very much, and to all. Uh, that remains for me uh, to say is uh, thank you everyone that's joined us, and I thank you very much for taking the time out uh, to present to us today, for, uh, dear Professor uh, Kilom. It uh, it's been really appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for this uh, opportunity, and thank you for all of you. Uh, actively engage with the, my presentation. Thank you very much, and all the best to all of you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I hope to see you soon in Egypt. Yeah. yeah. Goodbye. Bye.